Hi, you guys. Welcome back for another week of topics and tips. This week, as promised, we are covering common treatment options for COPD and asthma. Of course, this is not all inclusive, but the two that I picked to cover for this week um, are the beta agonist and the muscarinic antagonist. Now, I will link in the description my COPD and asthma videos that can help you as you walk through those stepwise approach and the four gold standards for COPD management. But I wanted to hit on those medications because as we prepare for boards, you know you need to be familiar with the actual medicines, the drug classes, how they may be abbreviated and which medicines fall into that class. So I wanted to be um, able to provide that for you and hope that this can help you with uh, preparing, okay? All right, let's get into it. Now, you know I like to always give a disclaimer. Uh, for those of you who are new to me, I am Dr. Brittany Weinstock, family nurse practitioner and founder and CEO of The Nursing Studio. You guys that usually follow me and have been here supporting me and those have helped me reach this many subscribers at this point. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome back for another week. But I like to throw out the disclaimer to say to you guys that this is designed for nurses and nurse practitioner board preparation, okay? This is not used as an all-inclusive treatment option, but simply to educate you who are preparing for boards, also for um, school exams, so that this may help you and aid in the retention while you are learning, okay? All right, let's hit to the next section. Beta agonists. Now, beta agonists, you may be familiar with these, also um, known as the beta adrenergic agents. They're used in the function of a bronchodilator. They relax our smooth muscles in various organs, but the ones that we are commonly paying attention to are those beta-2 agonists that are functioning um, to relax the muscles in the lungs, right? Because you know there's beta-1, there's beta-2, there's beta-3. Those beta-1s worked more towards the heart. Again, beta-2, which we'll be discussing, worked more, work more towards our lungs. And then just a little sidebar, beta-3 works on the bladder um, predominantly, okay? So one of those common um, ways to remember this is beta-1, you have one heart. Beta-2, you have two lungs so that you can remember which way that, um, which organ and system it is working on. But again, it's generalized function is to relax those muscles in that um, organ that is focusing in on. And what happens with those beta agonists is that they attach to those beta receptors, okay? And when they're doing this, for example, for the lungs, it's helping to smooth that muscle when it attaches to those receptor sites, allowing the lung, the muscles in the lungs to relax so that you're able to get more oxygenation, okay? Uh, likewise, with the heart, it's relaxing those muscles, which is allowing more oxygenated blood to be pumped out. So this is just a sidebar, but I know when we think of the betas, I don't want you to get confused, but think about beta blockers. And we know how beta blockers what they're utilized for, I should say, you know? And so beta blockers, what's happening, they're doing exactly what the name says. They're blocking those beta receptors. So when they block those beta receptors, those beta agonists can't attach to those, right? So that's why instead of relaxing those muscles, um, your, blood, your heart rate could be lower, your blood pressure can be lower. Because if you think about it, when the beta agonist that we're talking about, when it works on the heart, that beta-1 receptor, it is attaching and the muscles are relaxing. So the heart is able to work a little bit harder to pump out more oxygenated blood, which can cause your heart rate to increase, your blood pressure to increase, which are things that we have to look out for when your patients are on beta um, agonist therapy as well. But that's how the beta blockers come to play as well. So when I teach you, I like to kind of throw in those tidbits so you don't get kind of, you know, mixed up with the things that we need to know. But that's just a little fun fact, okay? So again, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and we're talking about the beta 2s because we are focusing in on those common treatment options for our COPD and asthma patients, right? So those beta 2, again, are the ones that are commonly utilized for lung um, management, they uh, are that bronchi bronchodilator, and there are there are two. There's your short acting, as well as your long acting. Right. So the short acting beta agonist, commonly known as your SABAs, that's where you see the S A B A. 
And those short acting um, beta agonists are your SABAs, again, the SABA. So it's just an abbreviation of short acting beta agonists, right? And I, I like to talk about that because for board's purposes, you may see it say SABA, S-A-B-A. You may see it say short acting beta agonist, or it may tell you those medications. And um, the most common one that we know is a short acting beta agonist is your albuterol, right? Lev albuterol is also another one, um, but albuterol is the most common. Albuterol, also known as your Provental, your Ventolin. Lev albuterol, also known as your Zopinex. Familiarize yourself with those medications. Um, I like to say always focus on the endings. It ends in buterol. So I say that's the basics. We start with the basics, right? B for basics, B for beta agonist, B for buterol. And with this, that albuterol, that lev albuterol, most common basic because it's going to be your rescue inhaler, okay? It's short acting. It covers you for a short period of time, but these are for our patients, our COPD patients, as well as our asthmatic patients um, to be utilized as a rescue inhaler, right? This is utilized in the fashion of any COPD exacerbation as well as any asthma attack. Every patient with those diagnoses should have one of these on board, okay? Next, we have our long-acting beta agonists, which is our LABAs, our L-A-B-A, LABAs, long-acting beta agonists. And the ones that fall in that category, category are your salmeterol, your formaterol. So I say think meterol as the ending. Remembering short acting are those basic buterols, right? B for buterol, B for basic. Now we're on the long acting and salmeterol and formeterol. With these, they have the M, the meterol ending, the M. So I say we went from needing basics in the short acting to needing more in the long acting, meaning more coverage, longer periods of times, right? And so they still give you that that smooth muscle relaxation in the lungs, but for a longer period of time, okay? So you will see that those are utilized in combination therapy as we progress in the gold standard for COPD patients, as well as in conjunction therapy with our asthma um, patients in the stepwise approach. And then remember, again, the link is in the description to those COPD and asthma treatment videos where I walk you through all of those things that you can tie it all in together. Today, I just really want to hit in on these common medications because I want y'all to start putting the pharmacology in with it, okay? Now, next, now that you know your medicines for the beta agonist, I want you to also know the things that you should look out for. And what I mean when I say that is, um, we talked about it a little bit, but you know, the patients can have tachycardia, they can have hypertension, they, be, they can become anxious, they can become um, jittery, complaining of shakiness um, when associated with these medications. So if we know this, we should also be sure that we consider that with patients who already have a pre-existing history of hypertension, tachycardia, anxiety, things of this nature, because if based upon the severity, you may not want to initiate the therapy because you don't want to exacerbate those. So patient by patient basis, you know, judge your patient, patient, but these are the things that you need to look out for, okay? And also, if you start to notice this, continue to monitor for those functions and those things that may occur, okay? And then we talked about what they are used for, um, with those beta twos, um, and that's your beta agonist. But as you study through these, I want you to write out and do this because you know I always talk to you guys about repetition, and I want you to always remember how I always tell you guys to study in preparation for boards because this is also how we practice, but this is what they're testing you for. So we are doing what? The assessment, the diagnosis, the evaluation, and the treatment. So in this fashion, you know, as we walk through that with COPD or asthma, and we have gotten to this treatment phase, I need you to know your drug class, how it works, that mechanism of action, the things that you need to uh, look out for those use those uses, and understanding which fall into the short acting, long acting stages of those so that you can know how to utilize those versus first line, second line therapy, and when not to utilize those, okay? All right, let's get into the muscarinic antagonists, also known as anticholinergic agents. And for those of you um, who are like me, we're more familiar with those anticholinergics. 
but they are called muscarinic antagonists, okay? But it's a, a, an agent in the anticholinergic class. So before we get into nitty gritty, I want you to think about those anticholinergic agents and things that we always look out for with anticholinergic agents. Now, y'all know with anticholinergic agents, we always think about how it dries everything up, right? So anticholinergic agents, it was a, it's always a little saying. I don't know if y'all ever heard it, but one of my, um, my undergrad BSN pharmacology teacher, I loved her, loved her, loved her. And she taught in the fashion of how I learned. You know, I, I'm the mnemonic, the Britney Spears, the, the jokes, the songs, the craziness that helps me retain. And she said the saying, can't see, can't pee, can't spit, can't, right? And so that always makes you think about it because of how this makes everything dry up, right? You can't see, your eyes get all dry. That's why you don't want to give this to the patients with glaucoma, things of that nature, because it dries up your eyes, you know? Um, can't um, pee because it causes urinary retention, dries up. They have a history of that. You want to consider not giving it to that population. Can't spit. It gives you that dry mouth. Everything's um, dry. And then can't what? Okay, so that causes that constipation. You know, so dries you up. The elderly population, you have to be really cautious with prescribing anticholinergics for them. So I just wanted to go ahead and hit that from the top because muscarinic antagonists are anticholinergic agents. So with these they are um, also bronchodilators and they aid in helping us with that dyspnea on exertion and relaxing those muscles as well. And there are three, re uh, three muscarinic receptors also, and this works by blocking those muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. They also have the short acting and the long acting in this one as well. So you will see those listed as SAMAs and LAMAs. So if you hear me going over those in my COPD and asthma reviews, this is what I'm talking about. SAMA, S-A-M-A, -A, being short acting muscarinic antagonist, or you might hear me say muscarinic agents, um, or long acting muscarinic antagonist, okay? And so same as we talked about our SABAs and our LABAs, this is working in the same way. So then our short acting muscarinic agent, the one that you commonly will know for your COPD patient and, um, once you get past that albuterol level or your rescue inhaler, these are first line therapy with our COPD people. Um, but ipotropium, also known as your atrovent, is your short acting muscarinic agent. And then your llamas, your long acting, is your teotropium, which is also known as spiriva. And I just say with short acting, the word is shorter, tropium. That ending is tropium for your short acting muscarinic agent, agents, whereas your long acting has a longer word, which is teotropium. Teotropium for the whole word um, for that long acting muscarinic agent. And those are the two big classes. And so again, when you're studying these, write it out. You don't have to make this something separate, but as you're studying your COPD, your asthma, and you get down to the treatment, I want you to write the, the medications out in this fashion. Write out the class, write out the abbreviation, write out the, um, the drug class as well as the drug name, the generic as well, being albuterol, ventolin, you know. Uh, ipotropium and atrovent, you know, write all of those things out. So you're studying it together. So whatever that they put out to you guys, you're able to um, quickly identify what they're asking you. And over preparation helps you for success. And I'm putting it out here because I know we study this stuff and we know it, but I want to give it to you in a short and sweet fashion so that you can quickly identify and quickly incorporate it into your study. Listen as you're you're uh, riding down the road or whatever, or cleaning at home or whatever, to hear these short and sweet reminders, so that we're starting to ingrain this into your study process, so that it will come naturally for testing purposes as well as as well as with practice. Okay, you guys. And as always. First, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. I hope that you all find this helpful. But as always, I tell you to meet me back here next week for more topics and tips. Prepare for tomorrow for Work It Out Wednesdays, where we work out practice questions on the topics that we have covered for the week. But be sure that you like, comment, and, and subscribe and share with 
whomever you know that may find this helpful as well. But be sure to meet me back here. Bye, y'all.